Good morning, Southside Bible Church. We get to worship God through His proclaimed Word. Now, what a blessing. I would like to welcome any guests that we have with us. We're always grateful when you come and worship with us. A couple, just a prayer request for Catherine Einspar. She um, went out to Africa last, uh, this week. She got there yesterday to an orphanage that she's going to be serving uh, in Africa through SIM, and she's praying about uh, a lifetime of going out there to serve this orphanage. So if you could pray for her, that God would be guiding her and using her, uh, but also for safety and protection and bringing her back to this body. And so uh, let's, let's pray for her. Father, I just want to pray for Catherine. I thank you for your protections and leading her out there. And I pray, Lord, that you watch over her and that you use her in a mighty way. God, that she would be a blessing to all those that she'll serve and wash feet and love while she's there. And we ask that you would guide and direct her life and keep showing her uh, the way you want her to spend her days serving the King of Kings. So please be with our dear sister, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're taking a few Sundays to just look at subjects that just God's been putting on my heart. We call it freelancing, and uh, it's been a blessing for me. Uh, and then we'll park in a book, and we'll go verse by verse through that, and I'm still praying over which one that would be. Last week, we took a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and uh, we were exhorted by God to run the race with endurance that's been set before each one of us as believers in Christ. And he told us there are encumbrances and sins that so easily entangle us. And, and we, we learned, I think we've learned in our journey that we let encumbrances sit upon us more often than we should because the sin which so easily entangles us, we, we fight. We're born again believers. We, we hate sin for all the right reasons now because of the grace of God. And when we see it, we fight it. It, it, it doesn't just sit in a peaceable manner in our lives any longer. But encumbrances I see in my own heart and in shepherding the flock, we tend to let them perch. We, we, we pet them and we give them nice little names and say things like, just, I, I worry a little bit. And, and they slowly, they weary us and our pace slackens and our run to glory becomes heavy. And so my, my desire is that uh, the writer said, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, is how these sins are mortified and how these encumbrances fall off. So we run looking to Jesus. And I've said before that I, I can run forever with the right scenery. The older I get, that's not all the way true, but I can run further if I'm on a beach than if I'm on a treadmill. And so let's run with endurance, brothers and sisters, looking to Jesus Christ as we run, and I just, I never, I never want to quit when I see the finish line and who he is, and so we just keep running till, till we see Jesus. And as I've been thinking and praying on last week, I wanted to help us to think a little more on these encumbrances, and, and how do we throw them off? And so I was led to 2 Kings, if you'll turn there, it's in the Old Testament, we, don't, we haven't turned there for a long time because of Romans, so 2 Kings chapter 6. Please turn there now. What a great passage, and just so many things have been jumping off the page in my study this week. So I'm asking God to bless you richly in His Word this morning, and that weights and burdens and encumbrances would fall off in our text today. And that passage that Pastor Rutland read, oh, I desire that that would fill our hearts this morning. So the way I want to approach this text is we're going to survey verses 8 through 23 in 1 Kings 6, and then we're going to spend a lot of our time on application. I, th I think the, the power of this passage will be how we apply it. So we're going to go to the throne of grace, and I, I know a bunch of you, I'm, I'm grateful for how many of you have bought that book. I mentioned uh, how to get the most out of the Lord's Day from Paul David Tripp, and this morning's um, passage that he had for us was there, there are three things when you come into worship, and, and we have fears um, that are con in our lives, and they're growing, and they're, they're hitting us as we sit here this morning. He says, then we have complaints as we look around at the things that we want 
and desire. And, and then the other is this independence instead of looking to God for His sufficiency. And so my prayer is that we would reorient as we come and worship now and that your hearts would be led to fear God so that you, your other fears will fall off as we see who our God is. And then the, the complaints are to look at all. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Instead of spending your life on what you don't have, I, we just need to, by faith, look at what we do have. And that'll keep you busy the rest of your days to be full of praise and joy in your God. And then any independence of, here's how I want to rule my life. Here's how I want to live it. I'm praying for our whole body surrendered to God, saying, here's my life, Lord, take it. It's yours. Let's not be independent of God, but surrendered and submissive to our God. So let's join him in prayer and ask that he would meet us in that this morning as we worship. God, I pray, I pray that you would be glorified this morning, that hearts have been so made full by the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. God, I pray that we desire for, for your name to, to be worshiped. We thank you as the giver of this gospel in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for those baptisms, God, and what we just see so beautifully, your power and who you are. God, I pray now, prepare our hearts then to worship in the word of God and, and let our hearts respond to what you've recorded in this word for our good. Thank you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> well, this passage has much to teach us about physical sight and about spiritual sight. I love those concepts. They're so um, just throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, were taught. Jesus one time boldly stood up and said in John 3, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. So unless you're born a second time spiritually, you'll never see the things that you just saw in those baptisms. You'll, you'll never get to the spiritual part. There's a spiritual kingdom that Jesus has inaugurated. And the eye of sinful man, thy mercies cannot see. Blind in sin and nature's night, said Wesley. So we're born into this world and all we can see is the natural realm. That's all that we have. And we can't see the spiritual realm when we come into this world. We cannot perceive it. In the spiritual realm, two plus two always equals five. We just can't get it. And, it. and it's why if you study every cult, they understand that there is a kingdom, spiritual, but how you get into it is always wrong. The answer is always five. There's some merit that you have to do to get in, and you'll never enter the kingdom of God that way. They, they just can't get grace. John Newton said, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I got spiritual eyes, and now the grace of God, I can see this glorious gospel. 1 Corinthians 2.14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. It's, it's foolish, this gospel. They can't understand them because they're spiritually appraised. They, they can't see spiritual things, so they'll never get the gospel. And I, I use this illustration, and it's worn out, but I'm going to use it again Old people over 50 maybe, maybe 60, 70. When I was in high school, I first got my driver's license, the, the only thing on the radio was what was called AM frequency. And, and AM frequency just didn't have good rock and roll. And I was an unbeliever and I just liked, I don't know, Journey. I hate to admit it. Journey, that was my favorite group. So I, I needed to buy a special antenna if I was ever going to hear FM. And without it, you, you couldn't hear it. But it was actually playing. And you put that antenna on, and now it comes right into your radio, and you could actually hear FM music. And the gospel is being preached in FM, and it's being preached and proclaimed, and you can't get it. You can't understand it. And the Holy Spirit gives you this antenna, and He opens your eyes, and all of a sudden you have eyes that can see, and this gospel takes over your heart and your life. And so what I want to show you this morning is some beautiful things from His Word about blindness, about sight, both physical and spiritual. This passage is just rich. So let's look at it 
now, if you'll turn with me, 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse 8. <clears throat> Hold on. 1 Kings 6, 8 is not going to get it done. I'm like, why did I pick that passage? That has nothing that's going to help me this morning. Okay, I'm, I'm done being nervous. Verse 8. Now the king of Aram was warring against Israel, and he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. So this book began with the ministry of Elijah, the prophet, and now we're moving into the ministry of Elisha, the other prophet. And these two men, many miracles and powerful things happened. They were great prophets of God. The very faithful, they preached his message to many blind people who did not respond in their ministry. But their, their sight of God keeps them faithful to their calling, and there's much to learn from these great prophets this morning. But the king of Aram, we, we would call that Syria today. And this king, most commentators say, was Ben-Hadad. And Ben-Hadad, there was the first and there was the second, and they're saying it's probably the second Ben-Hadad. And what he's doing is he's making raids on Israel, and he's sending groups out to come and attack them. We'd, we'd call them special forces almost. And they would go into these areas, and they would pillage and plunder them, and then take them into captivity as slaves. It was just greed taking their possessions. And the strategy of Ben-Hadad was to, to do unexpected raids on the outskirts where there wouldn't be as much protection and opposition to their tax. They, they weren't going to go into the capital and attack them. And so in verse 9, look with me. The man of God then sent word to the king of Israel saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the, our Arameans are coming down there. And so the man of God is Elisha the prophet, and he keeps warning the king of Israel, who was Jehoram, where they're going to raid them so they can fortify the area. And, and we know of Jehoram is that he would listen to Elisha to save his troops and his possessions, but he would not listen to him for how to save his soul. So he had physical sight, but not spiritual. Uh, so let's look what happens then in verse 10. The king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. So the king does listen to Elisha. And he guards himself from these attacks. And now in verse 11, the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing. And he called his servants and he said to them, will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? And so Ben-Hadad, he's angry. Of, he keeps going to do these secret attacks and they're just sitting there waiting for him, sitting ducks. And so the element of surprise has been taken away from this king. And his conclusion is, who in our camp then is a spy? Who's helping Israel? And the answer is spiritual. Jehovah God does not sleep or slumber. He watches over his people. Yet in this account, he's using a human instrument who's Elisha the prophet, and he's teeing him off. So in verse 12, one of his servants said to the king, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. I love this. <laughs> he's, he's telling you the words that you speak in your bedroom. This, this guy, it's like he's sitting in your room listening to every conversation that you have and everything you say. He just then tells everybody, so there's no spy. It's Elisha. He knows what you're planning. And it's as if he's in your bedroom listening. So it's, it's a prophet of God, not a spy. And he's the reason you're not conquering these areas and getting spoil and plundering and getting slaves. He's the one thwarting you. So what would one with spiritual sight say at this point? Uh-oh. We're fighting against God. And they're so depraved, um, they're going to just keep fighting against God. And I, I, can I just give you some quick application? Do not fight against God. You're going to lose. <laughs> Wait till you see what happens to these guys. So this king comes up with a natural-minded plan or idea, which we do many times in our battles. 
And in verse 13, he said, Go and see then where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. So here's our plan. Let's go take Elisha captive. Then he can't tell the king of Israel our plans in my bedroom. So let's get rid of the one who hears the secrets. And so it's natural mindedness of of how to solve a problem. And so Elisha is in Dothan. It was a town in the hill country of Manasseh. It was located about 10 miles north of Samaria and 12 miles south of Jezreel between Damascus and Egypt. So we're going to go capture him. And look in verse 14. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. So let's go and bring all the big guns and finish off this prophet thwarting my plans. And so they send a great army this time. And it has chariots. That would be like tanks in our day and age. And let's go take this man and silence the prophet of God. And they come by night and they circle the city And the enemy has surrounded Elisha, and they're now in great danger from what the natural man can see. You are now surrounded by a massive army. And in verse 15, now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And a servant said to him, alas, my master, what? Shall we do? So this attendant gets up early in the in last chapter. Uh, there was an attendant named Gehazi, and it, commentators are split whether that's him or not, but I'm going to say it's Gehazi. And he sees this army then surrounding them, which means what? We're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And it's so easy to read these passages with familiarity and forget what it would be like to be surrounded by a major army, your enemy. I've never had an army surround me, but I have felt this way. I've had times where I felt surrounded by the enemy. I've had circumstances choking me from every angle. Maybe depression is circling you even this morning. And there are arrows coming at you from all angles, and you don't see any way out. I would ask for a show of hands, but I I think I know if you've ever been there. And I've sat with some of you with such health battles on every side, and persecution at work, and and lately, just in your families, and how hard, it's like on every turn. I believe we're moving into a season where one day armies will surround us on every side. Unbelievers are persecuting us from all places, and maybe loneliness is just surrounding you uh, this morning. I've been noticing with the parents of all these little babies, we had 10, I think it was about 10 or 12 babies born last year, and in July, we have 10 more coming in a month. Praise God. (laughs) Praise God, but I just want to warn you for you new parents, it's a lonely time. Because before, you could go anywhere, you could go to any community group, and all of a sudden, you, you can't hardly do anything. And you can't even come to church, you know. Everyone in that room back there can't hear anything right now. They're just smiling. They're looking awesome. Their kids are making so much noise. They're all like, it's just good to be here, though. But it's, you're surrounded. And you're saying, alas, my master, what shall I do? What shall we do? And when you look at this from physical sight, it's dark and it's bleak. There, there's no help, humanly speaking. Do you know this place? There's no hope apart from your master. And Gehazi, he's asking the right question to the right person, his master. And one of the best answers I've heard to this question, and if I had any room left on my tombstone, honey, this would be it. So go to verse 16. I love this answer. What shall we do? And Elisha answers, do not fear. Why? For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I love it. Elisha, there's just two of us sitting here. (laughs) And there's a whole army surrounding us. I think you flunked math in grade school. No, my math is perfect. 
But I have spiritual eyes that God has given me to see the unseen things. And I'm counting way better than you are. God, give me this way of counting this morning. In verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Oh, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is good. I can only see the scene. I can only see the threat of an army and what you're facing here this morning. I can only see the limited resources to fight with. And the prayer is God open his eyes. Let him see the spiritual. The part that no man can see unless the Lord has opened your eyes to see it. And there's a bunch of you sitting here this morning who can see. The just shall live by faith. You shall live in the God that you can see through faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Lord heard Elisha's prayer and opened Gehazi's eyes. And then he sees the true reality. Guys, this is what faith does. It gives us the ability to see what is real and what is true. And it's not the scene. It's not the scene. The surrounders were surrounded by the armies of God and chariots of fire. Goosebumps. Verse 16, do not fear. And I've told some of you that, and you look at me and you're like, thanks, pastor, that really helps. How do I do that? Because I'm calling you this morning, a God of the universe is saying, don't fear. Whatever you're sitting in this morning, he's saying, child of God, don't fear. And fear is the root of every encumbrance that's keeping us from running the race that's set before us. And these encumbrances are weighing us down and we're living in these fears and, and we're just not getting anywhere. What I'm looking at is terrifying. When I went to see Austin and Claire Lee in the hospital, do not fear. How? Austin's sitting there wondering, am I going to have a newborn baby and raise this family by myself? You bet there's anxiety. Open my eyes, Lord, to see reality. Let me see the chariots of fire. I just need something bigger than my fear this morning. I need something more real to drive out my fear of what I see. But the chariots of fire are all around his master, and now he sees God's forces. And it's not just a vision of the power, but it's the presence of the power. You have the power of God. Open our eyes, Lord, this day for whatever is terrifying us, that we might see the power of God that is for us. It's my prayer for every one of us. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, and we're going to just finish the story. There was a famous guy named Paul Harvey, and he used to say, and now for the rest of the story. So come with me to verse 18, and we're going to come back to this. I, I reserve the right to come back. <laughs> verse 18. So when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And this word for blindness is an interesting word. It's only used twice in the Old Testament. The other was in Genesis 19.11 when the men of Sodom and Gomorrah are going after the angels and they're struck with blindness. And, and, and so here, there's this blinding flash. One commentator said it means to be bedazzled. It's like Paul on Damascus when he saw the glory of Christ, that bright light. So, so they see the, the brightness, the glory. This army is blinded, and I think it's the glory of God. It's radiance, and they're bedazzled. And then in verse 19, Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. <clears throat> and he brought them to Samaria. And so Elisha leads them there. And you know what Samaria is? It's the capital of Israel. <laughs> this is where all Israel's armies and forces are going to be. 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you where you need to go. And they're blinded, and he leads them into Samaria. I love this. Verse 20, when they come into Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And so the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they're in the midst of Samaria. So open their eyes, they look, and now they know they are in big, big trouble. What a, what a flip of providences. The, the, the threat that was killing us and keeping us up at night, now by the work of God, is now in trouble, and you're, you're the one commanding. We're behind enemy lines. We're sitting ducks for the armies of Israel. Definitely a turn by the providence of God. And verse 21 is really interesting. Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And the king of Israel now says, my father, this is an expression that conveyed the respect of a child for his father. And now Jehoram is giving Elisha the respect that he deserved. And so the question is interesting though, shall I kill him? Shall I kill him? Doesn't he seem a little too anxious? He seems happy to me and ready. And he doesn't know what kind of spirit of the kingdom of God, like the sons of thunder, when they ask Jesus, call down lightning. So in verse 22, he answered. Elijah says, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And so Elisha says, no. John MacArthur said it, that was an uncommon and unusually cruel, it was unusually cruel to put war captives to death in cold blood that were delivered to you clearly by the hand of God. So to, to ask such a question is you're, you're missing it. But Elisha, he shows kindness instead of killing them. And they were about to kill him. And, and what he does is he shares a meal with them. And at that time in history, if you sh shared a meal under the roof, you were making a peace treaty. And so he's now inviting them in, having a meal, making a peace treaty. And, and it says they never raided Israel again. Verse 23, he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. And the marauding bands of Arameans did not come again into the land of Israel. Isn't that beautiful? So let's make application and we'll close out. We live in the physical realm and we can't see the natural realm. An unbeliever can only live in the physical realm. That's why your life is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Let me get as much out of this seen life that I can till I die. And it's why they can't enter into true rest. Because there's so many things uh, that threaten us. There, you'll, you'll never get out of all the threats, no matter how hard you work, how much money you make. You'll never get away from all the threats in this world. And so we spend all of our days trying to mitigate, mitigate against those threats. Believers, we're given something special that only God can give. And I just want to read to you 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. And if our gospel is veiled... It's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case, the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. So you don't have eyes to see. And this gospel's preached and you see no value in it. You just keep trucking along, trying to get as much out of this life as you can get. And the, and the devil's blinded you and what you need is spiritual sight. And Paul says, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves as bondservants for your sake. So how do we get light? For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So God says, let there be light. And you now see the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. And those baptisms were two men saying, Here's my life. I see. I, I, mean, I was thinking of Casey just doing his little cubbies and all the things he said. He couldn't see. And God said, let there be light. And, and he doesn't cry. 
And now he can't talk about Jesus without tears overtaking his heart. When God opens the eyes, you now have a, a new sense and you can see spiritual things like what happened in our passage here this morning. I was listening to a preacher and he, he said there are three things that he sees in this text when God says, let there be light. The first one is that we're blind to our sin. So you, no matter how much you hear uh, you're a sinner, it, it doesn't register. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a great guy, but I'm better than my neighbor. So we don't understand the depth of it. And I've, I've always said, you think sin, sin is an S chromosome that your parents passed down to you and now you got a problem. But what it is, it's an attitude of the heart that pervades your whole being that is opposed to God and you want to be God. The unbeliever will admit sin and say, I, I told a lie. But a believer is permeated by his sin of how radically self-centered we are and think about ourselves day and night before salvation. If you ask an unbeliever if he sins, he'll say, yes, I'm not perfect. And if you ask a believer before he's saved, I do. So much evil. And the good things that I do are a filthy rag before God. I've done it to try to get God's favor. I've done it to try to get approval of mankind. Everything that I've ever done is polluted before God. So my bad things are bad and my good things are bad. That's when your eyes are open. And the reason I regret sin is not my consequences, but because against thee and thee only have I sinned and done what is evil. This is what happens when your eyes have been opened. And before you are blind to grace, the sweetest word I know, the soldiers in our context had no idea they were fighting God. They thought Elisha was their real enemy, but he turned out to be a friend and he saves the lives in Samaria. Can I kill him? Can I kill him? No. Grace is astonishing when God opens your eyes to finally realize what Jesus Christ has done for you in his work. I remember a while back sitting at a baseball game with a childhood friend. It was a, uh, we were going out before my other friend's wedding and as we sat there, I started to share the gospel with him. And I, you always feel bad, the poor guy that gets stuck sitting next to you at the baseball game. And after I got done, he said, Murph, do you mean to tell me that a good guy like me, who's tried his best to care about others, won't go to heaven? And a guy like Ted Bundy, who believes this message at the end of his life, goes to heaven? He says, that can't be right. That's stupid. And I say, when God opens the eyes to see the message of grace, it will cause you to be altogether born again. And this is not to try to work hard in a moral system to get right, but it's getting a whole new faculty and eyes to see spiritual things and you are now taken up with Jesus Christ. And you love grace and you give praise to God that he alone has saved me. He's opened my eyes. And the third thing is we've seen that we are blind. I want you to hear this. The mark of blindness is that you don't see it. You sit here and you think you're okay. Surely God wouldn't send me to hell. I'm a good guy. But when he's saving you, you finally see that you were lost and you were blind and you were an enemy to God. I pray that God would open the eyes of anyone here right now that needs to see Jesus. Open their eyes, Lord, that they would see Christ. Then we enter into the kingdom of God, and we are now called to live in this world while our true home is in heaven. Uh, Paul wrote, our citizenship is in heaven where we eagerly await a Savior. But in this rest of our life, as we are called to live this now by faith with this new faculty that we've been given by God to see the unseen things. And we are called not to fear. How? For those who are with you are more than those who are with them. You know what that's saying? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Do not fear. We have these encumbrances called fear Fear of rejection, fear of the future, fear of suffering, fear of hard providences. And they're keeping us from truly 
running. They just, they got you. And they're keeping us from the sweet place that Jesus is saying, I'll give you rest for your soul. Come, I'm going to be your God and you'll be my people and you can enter into a soul rest. You don't have to be all crazy. Our fears cause unrest in turbulent souls. This is the most anxious generation in the history of the world. And the good shepherd wants you to lie down in green pastures because he's your shepherd. And my prayer is open their eyes to that. Open their eyes. I look at this prophet with a great army surrounding him and there's no fear in Elisha. I want you to enter into that place this morning. Those are the people who run so well. Well, what was it? Well, he had eyes to see the spiritual realm and he could see the forces of God. And that's what drives out our fear. Paul said, if God is for us, who could be against us? So this is my passion and burden for Southside Bible Church, my own heart. Do not fear. I want to obey that with all my heart. But when the doctor puts your baby in your arms, and you have the tumor the size of your lung right above it, pushing your heart out of place. And you're told you have a T cell, which is very dangerous and maybe fatal. And the devil tells you all night you're going to die and you're not going to raise your daughters. And I come and whisper, Don't, do not fear. It feels small and unhelpful. And I just need something to gird up that command. When you look at your bills and they're so much greater than your income and you have five kids to feed and someone says, do not fear. Thanks, pastor. When you got to provide for your family and you got long hauler COVID and you can't stand up, much less work a 40, 50 hour job and you got no savings, what, what do you do? Parents, what do you do when that army is surrounding you? When you're getting older and you don't have any family, who's going to take care of me when I can't function? You have a special needs child. Who's going to take, them, take care of them if God calls me to glory? These are encumbrances. Say, how do I get relief? How do I get them off to run the race that's set before me? How do I not be afraid is the question. Wait, I've memorized every verse on the sovereignty of God. My theology tells me don't fear, and yet I'm sitting here this morning afraid. All I know from our text is pray, open my eyes, Lord, to see the true reality. Please, let me see. Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. This is that you might see the spiritual. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards you who believe? I pray, God, open their eyes of their hearts that they could see this. Show me that those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Right now, this morning, God, open my eyes. Is the answer chariots of fire surrounding us? I got something so much better for you than chariots of fire. I, you're a new covenant saint. And the answer is the, the blazing tongues at Pentecost is you have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you this morning. It's that I've been joined to Jesus Christ by faith. You're in union with Jesus Christ. And he says, nothing will snatch you out of my hand. It's, it is that his love is so abundant that nothing can separate you from it this morning. It's that God has a purpose that he says, nothing can thwart. Nothing can thwart. I will bring you to glory. He who began a good work We'll complete it. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and have been called according to his purpose. Isn't that better than a chariot of fire? You have God. You're accepted. You're forgiven. You're a child. He dwells within you. He's union with you. What more do we need? I got eyes to see. Open my eyes. Lord, let fears fall off this morning. Let encumbrances be thrown to the ground. Open our eyes. God.
let me see the truth and the reality this morning to not just look at life in the scene and battle it with the scene. We have God. We're not the right man on our side. Our striving would be losing. So this is how we run by faith. We live into the reality that God is for us in a million different ways, New Covenant believer. I, I can never find enough words for how God is for you. You're under grace, not law. And he'll take armies and use them to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. Whatever your enemy is that you're fearing, God will use it. It's, it's, in this whole story, that, that got turned around. And he'll take it and he'll use it to make you like Jesus Christ. The clouds that you so much fear will break with blessings on your head. God, open my eyes. I've watched him do it with so many of you. Perfect love drives out all fear. So I ask you, do you believe these things? Has God opened your eyes to see them? Have you gotten used to walking in fear? I'm trying to wake you up this morning. Don't be content in a life of fear. Look what God did for Elisha's servant. And he will do the same for you this morning. He can take his word and show you the chariots of fire that are surrounding you called the favorable hand of God. The just shall live by faith. Are you? Are you living by faith? I believe that Christians in our day and age are trying to live by sight. And I'm praying this morning, open our eyes. Reach out to someone if you're struggling, if you're stuck in fears. Let's work together to get these encumbrances off. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Amen? Amen. And my last thought, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I want you to get to a feast. <laughs> That's how this ended. And not death like the soldiers in our context. How could Elisha just let him go? Because he was a mediator who stood between the king and these men. They deserved death. They were bad men. They were going around killing people and, and plundering them. Elisha saved their lives that day. And my friends, he made a peace treaty with his enemies. So I just want you to hear something real simple. A few thousand years later, the soldiers would come to capture another prophet. And this time they're going to come to kill him. And when they came, Peter pulled out a sword and he took a swing at him and cut off his ear. And Jesus said, put your sword away. I could call 12 legions of angels at any time, chariots of fire. But how would the scriptures be fulfilled unless I go die? Jesus had the chariots of fire. But those angels did not save him because he came to do the will of him who sent him. And that was to come and die in our place for our sins. He was executed so you don't have to be. He went into darkness so that this morning you could be brought into the light of the gospel. He came to save you and to make a peace treaty between you and God and to invite you to a feast because he was executed in your place. Do you see that this morning? Open our eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful passage. God, I pray that burdens would fall off as by faith we look at greater is he that's for us than all those who are against us. There are more for us than those coming at us. God, thank you for the beauty of what we have in Christ. God, I pray, let us enter into this sweet place of rest, this place of looking to your full sufficiency, this place of how can we be afraid if you're our God? Do not fear. Do not anxiously look about you, for I'm your God. Lord, I pray, let fill up every heart with that. Give them eyes to see with every weight and every burden and encumbrance that they walked in here with. God, let, let this floor be covered with encumbrances and let us walk out in freedom as we look to the sweet Christ. God, thank you. I pray for any who came in here that need to take a look at Jesus, that right now sitting in their sin, they need a Savior. They need one who will stand before you and bear 
the full wrath of God for their sin and will bring them and let them sit at a table in fellowship with God. God, give them eyes to see this morning and let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.